word through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It is such a joy for my wife Meg and me to be back with you all. We've been so looking forward to this weekend. We love you. We love Light of Christ. And it's such a treat for us to, to get to be with you for this, this weekend every year. We've had a wonderful time. Needless to say, this is Light of Christ. We have been well fed. Let the record show. Uh, but we've had a, had a wonderful time and very much enjoyed uh, the teaching time yesterday and uh, time with the vestry. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a rich and, and, and blessed weekend. And we thank God for you all. But I especially want to thank God for your leaders, uh, for your, your pastor and rector, uh, Mike, and for all that you do in service of our Lord Jesus Christ and your, your great heart for this church and for this community. And I praise God for your leadership. We're going we're gonna to pray for Mike uh, a little later. I'll say some more things about, about him as he's battling this illness. But we'll, So I'll, I'll hit the pause button there and, and come back to that. But uh, to your clergy team, to Mary and Ed, we're so thankful for, for you both and for your, your faithfulness in ministry and service to to this church and um, the vestry and choir and indeed all of you this is a roll up your sleeves kind of church and I know so many of you are um, a part of of God's work in such important ways so, but thank you also especially I would say for your prayers uh, for your prayers for for Meg and me um, we travel on the prayers of the saints um, and for your prayers for uh, for your leaders and for for this church family um, I bring you greetings from our Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Foley Beach of the Anglican Church in North America, and all of his travels across the country and around the world, he sends his, his warm greetings uh, to you all. Well, let's turn to, to God's Word. Have you felt like giving up lately? Are you worn out? Exhausted from the pressures and the problems of living day after day? Or have you been discouraged? Maybe overwhelmed with health issues? Are you anxious about the future? Wondering if you're doing anything that has real significance? Or do you feel locked in? Frustrated by circumstances you can't control? Have you felt like giving up lately? If you have, you're not alone. In fact, you're in the best of company. The greatest heroes of the faith were at times all tempted to throw in the towel. Moses despaired of the burdens of leadership. Job cursed the day he was born. King David once said that it was futile to serve God. The prophet Elijah begged God to put an end to his life. Jeremiah lamented that he'd ever been born. The apostle Paul said he despaired even of life itself. Life, even for those committed to God, is not easy. This morning's reading in the letter to the Hebrews tells us that living for Christ is like running a race, a long and difficult race. It is not a quick sprint. There will be pain. There will be intense pressure from outside us to quit. There will be a burning desire from inside to drop out of the race. Hebrews describes in blunt and realistic terms the challenge to live faithfully for God. You know, that's one of the things I so cherish about the Bible. It never candy coats the Christian life. It always speaks honestly to us about what it means really to live for Christ. Because making a commitment to Jesus doesn't mean we won't have problems. It doesn't mean we won't experience pain. But surrendering to Jesus and living our life for Him can bring us a joy, a meaning and purpose in life we could know no other way. So let's look at our reading this morning and see what it says to people like us. People who at times can be discouraged and fearful 
and weary. The passage has words of wisdom for us, words that tell us how to hold on. But more than that, words that tell us how to run and finish our race gloriously. The passage says to us first that we are not alone. Verse 1, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now this letter has just described in the previous chapter the lives of some of the great heroes of the faith. And it's saying here that these faithful ones who've gone before us are now an inspiration to us. They encourage us. The faithful ones who've run their race ahead of us surround us, it says, like a great cloud of witnesses. But the word witness here doesn't mean they are watching us. No, the word witness is the Greek word martyr. They are witnesses for Jesus Christ. And in many cases, their witness for Christ cost them their lives. Hebrews isn't saying that these saints who surround us are witnesses of our lives watching us to see how we're doing. No, we watch them and we see how their lives have glorified Christ. Those who love God, those who are faithful to him are now in heaven, in the very presence of God. And they surround us in Paul's imagery in the stadium where the race of our life is taking place. And we're to be inspired by their examples. All of God's greatest, the famous and the unknown, they're all in heaven, inspiring us to keep on in our race. Some of you may with me remember the old RFK Stadium in Washington. And there the greatest heroes of Washington sports were immortalized on large signs on the front panel of the upper deck all around the, the stadium. And the players on the field could look up and see this ring of honor and the names of the greatest ones who had ever played on the Washington Redskins or the old Washington Senators and all the rest. And it's that kind of image, Paul is saying, that we are surrounded by the Christians of every age and we look to their courage. We draw strength from their faithfulness and we know we're not alone. My wife, Meg, and I, along with, with, with Mike, were privileged a year ago to be in Jerusalem for the Global Anglican Future Conference. And it was an amazing gathering of faithful Anglicans from around the world, lay and clergy. And so many of these godly leaders serve the Lord in extraordinarily difficult circumstances, in many cases enduring intense persecution often risking death for the sake of Christ in places like Myanmar and Sudan and northern Nigeria. The one chosen to be the general secretary, the executive officer and leader of our whole movement is Archbishop Ben Kwashi of Nigeria. Archbishop Ben is the Bishop of Jos in what is called northern Nigeria, though if you looked at a map you'd think it was in the dead center. He is the bishop of a large diocese and as an archbishop within Nigeria is responsible for overseeing many dioceses. He has the whole upper northeast quadrant of the country of Nigeria. And if you've heard stories on the news about Boko Haram and kidnapping girls and all the rest, all that happens in his area. Archbishop Ben and Gloria have lived lives of tremendous sacrifice. They have personally adopted over 200 orphans. Not running an orphanage, but over the years taking them all into their home, adopting them so they have a family name, and raising them and caring for them um, indeed as their, as their own. Three times large groups of armed men have come to their house to kill Archbishop Ben. First happened a number of years ago, but he was delayed coming home from an international conference. 30 armed men came and broke into their home to kill Ben. Ben was not there, but they attacked his son. They brutalized his wife, Gloria. They paraded Gloria naked through the streets and left her blind. By God's grace, she was later healed. 
and lives the most life full of grace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Meg has, with Gloria, led a retreat for the bishop's wives in Kenya and testifies that Gloria is this radiant, joy-filled woman who loves to laugh and loves to pour out her heart for others. Uh, an extraordinary witness. A second time they came to kill Ben. Again, large group of armed men broke into the home, took Ben out to kill him outside the home. They got to the edge of their little compound and decided, well, we know we're going to kill you in your house. And so they took him back into the home. Ben said, may I pray before you kill me? And they said yes, so he went down on his face before the Lord. And in a few minutes later, his son came in and said, Daddy, they've gone. I mean, it's like the book of Acts. It's just the Lord's hand was on them. A third time they came while we were together with Ben and Gloria in Jerusalem. Uh, they killed their neighbor who was looking after their home and stole all of their cattle, which was their sole means of support of all these many orphans living in their home. These are those who serve with extraordinary courage and extraordinary joy in the midst of tremendous suffering. It is humbling and so very encouraging to be with saints like this, to hear their testimonies, to witness to their godliness and to their love of the Lord, and to know that it is saints like these who are indeed leading our global Anglican movement. We are not alone. Second, we need to understand that we are to run, our reading says, the race that is set before us. One of the reasons the race of our lives often seems so hard for us is that the particular race that each of us is to run is not the race of our own choosing. We do not get to select the way that we are to follow Christ. We do not get to choose the circumstances and the surroundings to suit our likes and dislikes. God chooses the unique race of our own life. How hard it will be, how long it will be. We are to run the race. For one, it's being called to serve God in the military. For another, it's been to serve him in the classroom. For one, it's being called to raise a special needs child. For another, it's coping with chronic physical pain. For one, it's being called to manage significant financial resources. For another, it's honoring God with very little. Someone else's race might seem easier than yours. But God says to you, I want you to run this race. Don't get caught up in comparing your calling to others. Others have burdens and obstacles you know nothing about. Don't think about the others. Run the unique race that is your life. After Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus spoke to the Apostle Peter about what Peter would one day experience as he served Jesus. And then Peter asked Jesus about the Apostle John and said, what about him? But Jesus gently rebuked him and said, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, don't get sidetracked comparing your experience, your life race with someone else. There will always be those who seem to have an easier time of it and those who seem to suffer much more than we do. Be compassionate to others, pray for them, minister to them, but don't get caught up in comparing your experience with others. Third, the Bible says we must lay aside every weight. The image here is of the athlete at the starting line stripping away the excess clothing and equipment in order to be unencumbered for the race. Those warm-up clothes aren't bad things, but they get in the way. They hinder the runner from doing his best. Some of us are weighted down in our efforts to run our race in Christ. Some of us are weighted down by one large object like a ball chained to our ankle. 
And that might be our devotion to our career, valuing it above all else. It may be our possessions, our lifestyle. I will run the race, Lord, but only if I can have my things as well. Others of us are weighted down not by one large object, but by countless little ones. Like a stylish athlete who wears not one gold chain, but dozens and dozens and dozens of them. We can be dragged down in our race by the seemingly unimportant things which sap our energy and our time and our money. The hobbies and interests and commitments that divert us from Christ and his kingdom. That's one of the great blessings of the generous giving of our money. It helps us put aside lesser things and simplify our lives for the goal of running the race and living for Jesus. I'm so thankful that Meg and I long ago made a commitment to tithe, to give back to the Lord 10% of all that we receive, and then year by year to go far beyond the tithe. Because tithing helps us to run unencumbered by the stuff we're prone to pursue and acquire. How many people I know who long ago heard God call them to give their all to running with Christ, living a life of radical commitment to him. But they let the slow accumulation of habits and possessions and other priorities weigh them down and pull them out of the race. I had a seminary professor who was an overweight couch potato. He said he occasionally had an almost uncontrollable urge to exercise, <laughs> but he found that if he'd lie down after a while, the feeling went away. <laughs> well, all too many Christians have heard God call us to run the race of the Christian life with profound dedication and devotion. But we went off and did our own thing for a while, and pretty soon the urge went away. I suspect that some of you used to be more on fire for God than you are now. God is calling you to put aside those things which are weighing you down, those other priorities, and to get back in the race for him with every bit of energy and passion that you have. Researchers have found that over 60% of the American population claim to have made a commitment of their life to Jesus Christ that is still important in their life today. 60%, and that's a current figure, 60% say they have given control of their life to Jesus. I don't care what your politics are. Does this country look like 60% of the population is doing every day what Jesus said to do? Hardly. God can do more through one person who is profoundly committed to him than through a thousand who say they are committed but in fact have other priorities. What do you need to lay aside to run the race that Jesus calls you to do? Fourth, we must lay aside sin which clings so closely. I grew up in St. Louis playing soccer, which for reasons we never understood was a winter sport. And so we prayed, played in the rain and the snow and the mud and all the rest. We used to say we didn't know soccer balls rolled until we got to college. One of the things our, our coach said though was that you, as, no matter how cold it got, and we sometimes had questioned whether the insurance company would cover us when the windshield was 20 below. You had to wear play in shorts because sweatpants get soaked in water and mud. You can't play freely and effectively and as well as you can wearing sweats. We always felt we can make it, we can do it because we were concerned about comfort rather than playing our best. Well, our sin is comfortable too. Surely, we think, God doesn't want us to be uncomfortable in this race. Our sin is comfortable as long as you don't care much about pleasing God. We all know the Olympics demand serious athletes. The Olympics is not a pickup game for those who'd like a little exercise. And the Christian life is for those who are willing to get serious about living for God. 
and those who are willing to get, deal with their own sin and their own disobedience of God. What sin, what habit, what addiction are you carrying that is weighing you down, holding you back? There is great joy and freedom in dealing honestly with those ungodly patterns in our lives. Whether it's a dependence on alcohol, or the use of pornography, or out of control anger, or a history of broken relationships. God has healing for you if you will deal honestly with yourself and seek the help that you need. There's no shame in getting help. Every quality athlete has a coach, someone who can spot problems, someone who offers encouragement and accountability. And in running the race of our lives in Christ, we need coaching too. Someone to disciple us and encourage us, whether it's a small group leader, a person you meet with to disciple you one-on-one, -on -one, your AA sponsor, someone to coach you and help you deal honestly with sin, with patterns in your life that block you from experiencing the freedom and joy that God intends for you in your race. And finally, we look to Jesus. He is, the Bible says, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. It could also be translated, he's the author and finisher of our faith. In other words, Jesus designed the race, and he was the first one to run it to the end. He created the world that we live in, but he also came to live as one of us and show us what a perfect human life looks like. He's our example our role model because he ran his own faith, race faithfully and he's also here for us giving us the strength to complete our own race we look to Jesus and that means we look away from everything else he's our goal to be with him forever he's the way he's like the track under our feet holding us up at every moment look to Jesus don't look back don't look to the side and get distracted. Look at Jesus. He was so single-minded in obeying his Father that he endured torture and death on a cross. He experienced total humiliation. But it didn't matter what it cost because he had his eyes on the prize. He had his eyes on the joy that he would know with the Father if he was faithful and if he ran his race to the finish. Consider Jesus, the letter to the Hebrews says. Consider Jesus who in, endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Yes, what we're going through is tough. But look at Jesus and take heart. He endured all that you are going through and worse. Hang on. Keep running the race that God has given you to run. Don't be like the guy who was said to be great at the 95 meter dash. Run the whole 100 meters. Persevere to the finish. In 1968, in the Olympics, and I remember this event, the country of Tanzania selected John Stephen Akwari to represent it in the Mexico City Olympics. His event, the marathon. Along the race course for the marathon, Akwari stumbled and fell, severely injuring both his knee and his ankle. By 7 p.m., a runner from Ethiopia had long since won the race. All the other competitors had finished. Just a few spectators were left in this huge stadium when a police siren at the gate caught their attention. Limping through the gate came number 36, Akwari, leg wrapped in a blood-soaked bandage. Those present began to realize that they were seeing something very special. And they began to cheer as the athlete slowly, courageously completed his final lap of the race. Later, Akwari was asked by a reporter the question that was on everyone's mind. Why did you continue in the race after you were so badly injured? Akwari's reply, 
My country did not send me 7,000 miles to begin a race. They sent me to finish a race. And God didn't send you to start the race of your life in Jesus Christ. God sent you both to start and to finish. No matter where you are in your race, what stage of life, God is calling you to serve him faithfully. By sharing your faith, your relationship with Christ, with those you encounter each day. By giving sacrificially the financial resources God has entrusted to you. By discipling and investing in others, particularly those younger who are coming along after. Reaching out, opening your heart, investing and caring for those who need to be raised up in the faith. And it may be by praying intensely. Some of God's most faithful, powerful intercessors have had that calling emerge in their later years. My wife's mother, Meg, uh, my wife Meg's mother, Anne, lived with us for the last 20 years of her life. Anne had been disabled her entire life. She had rickets as a young girl and it caused her legs to be severely bowed. When I first met her, she was getting around slowly on a cane. Over the years, she went from a cane to a quad cane to two canes, to a walker, to a wheelchair, to being bedbound. I can still see her in my mind, in her pew, in the second row of the church, with her twisted arth arthritic hands raised to God in praise. You see, as she declined physically, she only grew spiritually. The less she was able to get about, the more powerful she became as an intercessor. And people turned to her from all over, beseeching her to, to pray for this person or that person, this need or that concern. And she would latch onto those concerns like a pit bull and pray for those in need, especially for children, uh, for years and years uh, as a faithful uh, prayer warrior and woman of God. Like the Apostle Paul, when we come to the end of our life, we want to be able to say, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And we want our Lord to say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I ask that you would speak to each one of us here, each one whose heart is open to you. And I ask that you would show us more clearly the race that you have set before us. Show us more fully how to live for you. Jesus, give us the courage to run, following your example and drawing on your strength. Lift us up when we stumble and encourage us when we are fearful. Empower us when we are weak. Strengthen us by the encouragement of the saints who have gone before us. And keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord Christ. For it is you whom we trust. And it is you whom we obey. And it is in your most holy name that we pray. Amen.